Let's open our Bibles to Second Samuel chapter one. If you'll remember last time, uh, Saul and his three sons, Jonathan and his two brothers, were all killed in battle, and their bodies hung on the wall. If you go to the ruins of Beth Shen in Israel, you can stand there and look up, and you'll see the hill. And usually, the tour guide will point out that's where that wall was, where uh, Saul and his sons were hung their bodies, and remember those they were retrieved and dealt with properly. Now as we enter the second book of um, Samuel, second Samuel now, David's going to hear of Saul's death. Now it came to pass <coughs> after, <coughs> after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, as it turns out, Amalek, by the way, was Esau's grandson, so just as a piece of trivia. It, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. So Ziklag, about a hundred miles away, guy comes and his clothes are torn. He's got dirt on his head, it says earth on his head. And that was a traditional form of, of mourning. They would tear their clothes. And even in the new tradition of the Jews, oftentimes the, the men will have a pocket like half sewn on. So if they have to tear their clothes, they can tear that pocket off and it's easily sewn back on again. But uh, that was the tradition of mourning was to tear their clothing and, and throw dirt up in the air and let it land in their head and in their hair. So as David learns of Saul and Jonathan's uh, death while he's still in Ziklag, living still amongst the Philistines, um, realizing his own deliverance that God had had his hand upon him, delivered him uh, since that disaster at, at Ziklag. In verse 5, let's read through to verse 10. And David said unto the young man that told him, How unknowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear. And lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he would not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. Well, well if you look at the, the story back in chapter 31 of 1 Samuel, it, it says that uh, Saul fell on his own sword that he killed himself because he didn't want them to have access to him. Is this a contradiction in scripture? I guess we have to ask, well, who's telling the truth here? I would say the word of God is telling the truth because if he's telling the truth, then Saul tried to kill himself and failed, and the Amalekite kind of finished, it all, finished the job. It's more likely here that the Amalekite is lying and uh, it's more likely that uh, he was the first one to Saul's body, and he took that crown and the bracelet, and uh, he thought he would tell David that he had killed Saul because Saul has always been chasing after David, and so he'll be happy that this man took care of this enemy of his, uh, that, uh, that the Amalekite had taken care of Saul, so David would, would thank him, maybe even reward him for killing Saul. So let's see what David says. Verses 11 and 12. Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening. For Saul and for Jonathan 
his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. So here's the Amalekite thinks, well, I'm going to make some points here. I'm going to take out David's enemy. What is David's reaction here? He's mourning for Saul, this man that's been chasing him, trying to kill him. And it shows that David had the right heart towards Saul. Think of the kind of heart that Jesus had when he wept over Jerusalem, the city that would ultimately kill him. And I'll just read you a verse out of Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, for Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. So uh, Jesus saw what was going on in Jerusalem. His heart was broken for it. And David had lots of opportunities to hate Saul, but he didn't give himself that opportunity. He didn't give in to that. So he did have good reason. It seems we don't know that Saul hated him, but he sure looked like he did. He was, he certainly was uh, out to kill him. He chased him. He tried to kill him. Really made David's life pretty miserable. And uh, so David's kind of in a, a, a strange situation here where he has a, the joy of having, he's going to gain the throne now and the sorrow at the king's death. <laughs> Someone said it's kind of like watching your worst enemy drive over a cliff in your new car. <laughs> it's, it's called mixed emotions. <laughs> so, but uh, remember this, that when we choose to hate someone, uh, we become slaves in bondage to our emotions. And uh, we actually give our enemy victory over us uh, when our, because it's, it's called a root of bitterness. And roots grow, grow slowly and deeply, and they they, when they entangle our heart, they embitter our heart. And bad place to go. Verse 13. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I'm the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? See how he refers to Saul? Not as that guy who was trying to kill me, but this is the Lord's anointed. And God, David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, Scripture doesn't say he did, but he claimed to have, trying to gain some benefit for himself. So David executed the, the Amalekite. Why? Because he had claimed to kill the Lord's anointed King Saul. Notice he called him the Lord's anointed, not the guy who's been chasing after me, not the guy that I've been running from, but God's anointed. And David's grief for Saul was real. It wasn't an act. He's not putting in an act here. He didn't uh, give some, he, he wasn't secretly in his heart thanking the Amalekite for taking Saul out. Instead, he gives honor to Saul. If you look at this Amalekite, set out to deceive David, hoping for a reward, traveled up around 100 miles, a long way in any age, but he got caught in his own lie, and he died as if he had committed the crime. So what was his mistake? He had his own idea of what was going on here. He really judged David by his own understanding of the situation and his own moral standard of what he thought he would get out of it, And he was certain that David would be pleased, I'm sure. Why? Because David would gain by Saul's death. Look at David's heart towards Saul to date. (laughs) He led Saul's armies to victory. He was close friends with Saul's son, Jonathan, who was next in line for the throne. At one point in time, remember, he, he played the harp to calm Saul. And what did Saul do? He ended up taking up a, a spear and throwing at him. He actually had several opportunities in caves uh, where where Saul didn't know he was there, and he could have killed Saul and didn't. And uh, David recognizes God's sovereign hand on God's anointed, both Saul and he. So David had waited for the crown, and now it's brought to him by a liar who's seeking rewards. (laughs) The Lord can use anybody in his kingdom to bring his will about. Uh, and the, uh, it was the Amalekites that burnt Ziklag, and uh, it was the Amalekite that led David to uh, the stolen stuff after Ziklag. 
and now it's an Amalekite that claims to kill Saul. It was in the Amalekite that brought Saul's crown and his bracelet to David. And this Amalekite had a pretty low moral code here, you can see. And he had a low opinion of David, too. He expected he would behave the way he wanted him to behave, trying to bring David down to his own level. And pleased and willing to gain through Saul's death. The king. How many people today are willing to gain at the expense of others? Heart of mankind maybe hasn't changed a lot in the last few thousand years. This is, according to my Bible, this is taking place at about 1056 B.C., so it's about 3,000 years ago. <laughs> Heart of man still the same. Verse 17, I want to read right through to 26. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there... For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul as though he had not been anointed with oil. For the blood of the slain from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than angels or eagles, they were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet, with other delights, who put on or ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? John, o Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee. My brother Jonathan, very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women." Now, that last verse, verse 26, is often used as a, a homosexual verse, you know, that he loved him more than women. It could mean uh, David's love of women was not all that experienced, even though he had uh, two wives, or that women's love for David was not that experienced. Anyway, either way you look at it, uh, David and Jonathan did share a special love for one another, man to man. They had a deep godly love for each other. Not homosexual. That's not what this is saying. In our present world today has trouble believing and understanding that a love can be deep and real without having a, a sexual aspect to it. We know it can be, though. Uh, verse 27, how are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? So uh, David is lamenting for Saul and Jonathan. And he mentions the book of Jasher. It turns out the book of Jasher uh, is also mentioned in Joshua 10.13. Uh, it's evidently a collection of early poetry. It, it's not what we call a missing book of the Bible. It was, it was another book written in that time. It's just because it's mentioned, it doesn't mean it's part of the canon of Scripture. It doesn't mean it's inspired or missing. There's one called the Gospel of Thomas also, uh, called the Missing Gospel of Jesus. But this song of the bow shows David's true feelings for Saul and for Jonathan. And, and David makes some points here. He calls Saul the beauty of Israel. He says that no one's to rejoice in Saul's death, but that everyone should mourn. And he says even the mountains and the fields praise Saul as a mighty warrior. And he calls Israel to mourning, to mourn their king, and praises Saul for the good that he's done for Israel. It wasn't all bad. Chasing David is one of the things we hear a lot about, but Saul wasn't all bad for Israel. And he, uh, he mourns for Jonathan. Jonathan was very near and dear to his heart. He remembers their, their deep and their committed friendship to one another. And consider Jonathan, how he loved David. Think about it. He was next in line for the throne. He gave up the throne for David because he saw that David was the next anointed. He saw David as God's next chosen king. And David's experience with women in love was not that great, at least in the beginning. Multiple marriages he had kept him from experiencing God's ideal, which is one spouse, one mate, one woman, as a close love and companion for life. 
But notice what is missing here, and that's bitterness. There's not a bitterness in David's heart that he's giving out here. David could have lived his life in bitterness for Saul, for the way Saul was treating him as he was only trying to serve him. The work of God's grace removed that bitterness. Paul, I love what Paul said in the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. <laughs> Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, David's natural reaction, we would think it would be, be grateful at Saul's death. Relief, finally, that he's not being chased and persecuted and he can return home now, and he doesn't have to worry about Saul chasing him. And, and uh, the realization that uh, Samuel's prophecy, when he anointed him with oil, is going to come true. And, and let me just go back to First Samuel 16. I want to read verses 11 through 13. Samuel said to Jesse, uh, David's thinking about this, Are here all thy children? And he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he keeps the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look at, look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this be he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him as David in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah indication that David early had the Spirit of God on him and that maybe that was what gave him the strength to <laughs> wait, wait. And, and David seems really concerned with uh, the death of God's anointed that the God of Israel is not dishonored. That's a good way to look at things. That the Lord is first in his life. David was able to separate Saul from his sin. Saul made David a fugitive and yet David is honoring Saul. Because at this point in time, he's God's man of the hour. But uh, he didn't look at Saul with bitterness, with hatred, for the way he had treated him, David, but with pity and sorrow for the, the sins that Saul had done, which he needed not to do. And we should have an attitude of brokenheartedness towards sinners, too, of pity maybe and sorrow, and, and pray their blindness be removed. We were all blind at one point, and now we see. Hallelujah. But it was God who opened the eyes. Second <clears throat> um, Samuel chapter two. David and Ishbosheth. As it, and it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, "Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah?" And the Lord said unto him, "Go up." And David said, "Whither shall I go up?" And he said, "To Hebron." I like that. I like the brevity of it, right? Not a great paragraph or anything. See, that would fit on a post-it note. I, I, I like that. I, I would want the Lord to give me post-it notes. So far, he hasn't. But uh, that's a nice way. You get up in the morning, you go to the fridge, and there's a post-it note of what you're to do that day. It doesn't work like that. So David, <coughs> verse 2. So David went up the thither, or went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household. And they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there, there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they that buried Saul. So David is now king over Judah about to receive God's promise, which was made, by the way, 15, 20 years earlier when he was anointed by Samuel. It's been that long. And we, we see a godly conduct. He doesn't rush in and seize the throne. He seeks the Lord first. How shall I do this, Lord? He's praying, not when all else failed. He's not at that point where sometimes we get, sometimes I get, oh, all I can do is pray. Well, that's where we should have been doing first. This is his first resort. That's good. Because God's guidance is what we want the most. That's what's most important. But David also knows that Israel got what they wanted. Remember, they were led by prophets before, and now he, they wanted a king like the other nations. They wanted a government like the other nations. And where are they now? Well, the king's dead. <laughs> 
David, who was once chased by Saul, is now anointed by Samuel, was anointed by Samuel as the next king. It, it, David knew that it was important and it was better to let God lift him up instead of striving to advance himself and just rushing forward. You know, one of the things we all come to realize is that when God is not at the throne of our hearts, something or someone else is. There will always be something or someone that we worship. And it's important that God be there. So we need to be careful <clears throat> that God is at the throne of our heart. We should be a striving to advance God's kingdom and, and leave our own quote-unquote advancement in God's hands in the direction that our life takes also. Verse 5, And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord that you have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I also will requite or repay you this kindness, because you have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened, and be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. So David's thanking the men of Jabesh Gilead here for rescuing the bodies of Saul and his three sons. Reward shouldn't always be our motive, but it often is a, a reward for righteous behavior. Not always in the world, but remember David's heart. He would not lift his hand or his heart against the Lord's anointed, Saul. And even now, when Saul is dead, giving honor to the one who would have killed him if he could have. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5:44: Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. How in the world could we ever do such a thing as that? Only by the power of the Holy Spirit. My carnal self doesn't want to do that. I want to see this is an audio tape, so they can't see this. Okay. <laughs> My carnal self wants to solve problems that way, you know. <laughs> but that's not how we're to be. We're to be Christ like. Well, loving our enemies. Bless them that curse us, do good to them that hate us, and pray for them to despitefully use you and persecute you. And that can be a lifelong project. Really. Verse eight verse eight. I'll read through eleven. <clears throat> but Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. In the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So the Lord sends David to Hebron, a city of Judah, with all his men, but also with all of his household, <laughs> the whole families. Same men who shared with him when he was in misery and when he was fleeing, now are going to share in his prosperity. But there is op opposition. Abner, Saul's cousin, he's the commander of Saul's army, uh, back in 1 Samuel 14, verse 50, it says, The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz, and the name of the captain of his host was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Now, Ishbosheth is Saul's only surviving son. So Abner sets Ishbosheth up as king over the rest of Israel. Probably because Ishbosheth is weak and it goes along with the things that Abner, who is a powerful guy, does and says. But Abner would be the real power before the throne. Consider that. Strong men bringing weak men to power so that they can be the real power. Can you imagine such a thing happening today? Yeah, my, that's, a, that's a mixture of irony and sarcasm, I think. Oh. The division between Judah and the rest of Israel will be worse after Solomon. Solomon is going to be David's son. Great kingdom during his reign. When he dies, then the nation will be split in two permanently. And Ishbosheth is not the Lord's anointed like Saul was, as David was. So David must oppose him. And interesting, just as an insight here, if you turn to Psalm 27, 
nice thing about the Psalms, if you take your Bible and pop it open in the middle, it usually opens in the Psalms or Isaiah. Uh, but Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 27, it refers to this part of David's life. He's reflecting upon it. 14 verses. It's a Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Does this sound familiar? It's a verse out of one of the songs we sing, out of one of the hymns. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. That rock is Christ. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. How, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, or hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou said, seek, my fa- seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over the, uh, unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Waiting, isn't that one of the hardest? It's a good prayer uh, when in trouble. Let's look at verses 12 through 17 now. Back to Second Samuel chapter 2. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out to Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Then there arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. Wherefore that place was called Helkath. Hazurim, meaning field of swords, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. War between Israel and Judah. Abner's troops under Ishbosheth face Joab's truth under troops under David. And David or Joab was David's chief military assistant. His brothers Abishai and Asahel are, are David's nephews. That's uh, found in First Chronicles chapter two. In Abner and Joab, they're they're very similar men. They're they're soldiers. They're tough. They're they're very hardened for battle. Uh, they're very mean, but they're completely devoted to their leadership to their leader. And the soldiers lined up against each other for a contest. It was just meant to be like a sporting event or a, a, a duel. 12 against 12, 12, and it degenerates into a bloodbath. And it would appear that perhaps all died. I'm not certain of that. And verse 18 says, And there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. He was a good runner, very light on his feet. And Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. You can see Abner, you know, he's got his gear on, he's plodding along, and he's got his spear in his hand, and this this uh, Asahel is running along behind him, taunting him. 
And Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. In other words, get ready for battle. But Asahel would not turn aside from following of him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? Albeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of his spear, which was sharpened to a point, by the way, he smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass, pass that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died, they stood still. So, Zeruiah, David's sister, Zeruiah, Asahel is David's cousin, and uh, it's certainly in a warrior, fleetness of foot is, is important, but uh, Asahel was very ambitious. Joab was the general. He's pursuing the general, really, of the enemy at this point. And he was warned to turn back. He was warned to just quit bugging me, yield, get away from here. And uh, Abner's spear, which was sharpened at one, they would use it to stick it in the ground. He just thrust backwards when he got too close. And uh, not sure what Asahel was carrying, but Abner killed him in self-defense, we think. And now he's thinking, how am I going to face your brother Joab? And, you know, Abner was a mature and older guy. Asahel's this young guy, really light on his feet. Thought he'd either taunt or maybe come in close enough to take a couple of swings at him. At him, Thought himself superior to an old man. Common, can be a common and, nat- and a natural misconception. But because of his self-confidence, this is what brought him down. Not fearing the opposite end of the spear, which was far from blunt. <laughs> Trusting and very proud of his speed and his lightness of foot, how often we can be betrayed by our own self-confidence, the things that we're most proud of, as he was. That's uh, verse 24. I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. So Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner, and the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amah that lieth before Gaia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner, and became one troop, and stood on the top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou had spoken, surely then in the morning the, the people had gone up every one from following his brother. So Joab Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithron, and they came to Mahanaim. And Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servant 19 men, servants 19 men, and Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that three hundred and threescore men died. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which is in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at the break of day. So Abner, what he did here was he he requested a ceasefire, basically. Let's just stop fighting with each other. Let's stop warring with each other. We're one people. And they both agreed. They're hoping to avoid a long, bloody civil war, families against families. And the process in this settlement here, 360 of Abner's men already died, and David lost 20. God's hand, we can see even more of God's hand on David as David's strength is increasing and Saul's house is weakening. One of the interesting things in the New Testament that is important for all of us is John verse 330 which John the Baptist said, he must increase, meaning Jesus, but I must decrease. A successful and fruitful walk with the Lord means that we must decrease, meaning our own will, our own strengths, our own having to have our way. That must decrease as the will of God through the power of the Holy Spirit increases. 
because that's how the Holy Spirit works. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God spoke to the Apostle Paul, and he said, I quoted this earlier, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is shown perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, as Paul speaking, speaking, a glory in my infirmities, so the power of Christ may rest in me. And, and God's will will be done, but we need to wait oftentimes. We need to wait until God can work through us. So God himself performs his will in working through us and not be relying on our own strength and our own understanding, not always taking matters into our own hands, oh, I don't even need to pray about this, but fully and totally relying on the Lord. And that's, a, that's a thing, I think it's a, that again is a lifelong walk because we all have our own strengths and our own weaknesses and our own opinions. And we want to we wanna know, we want to know what to do, but we need to wait on the Lord, pray to the Lord, listen for the Lord, and, and wait on the Lord until we get those answers, fully relying on the Lord. I want to close in prayer. So Lord, uh, thank you for these wonderful examples in David's life, and Asahel and Abner and Joab and the people of Israel, Lord, and how even in a, a time of great difficulty they can resolve their different differences and set aside the warring. Our greatest war is in our flesh, Lord, warring against you. So help us to have victory, Lord, yeah, that your Holy Spirit reigns and dominates us. You lead us into the deep things of God. Thank you for doing that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.